He, he, he loves the Nets, and, and he watches uh, the Nets and the 76ers, and he also watches all the other former ABA teams closely. Um, he just said that uh, said all the right things about James Harden and Kyrie Irving, although that Kyrie Irving spells his last name wrong. <laughs> uh, but, yes, he, he watches, and he expects them to be in the finals. Yeah, and I think most people do at this point. And you continue to put on performances like they have last night. I mean, it really is incredible that you know, this was all about Kevin Durant for the Brooklyn Nets. It was all about him. And we know that last year he didn't play, and we know that this year now he's been out for one reason or another lately because of the hamstring. And now, really, the Nets are all about James Harden. And that's what they've been all about. I mean, even Kyrie Irving takes a back seat to the James Harden story, not only on the court, but you know, a story like last night where he goes back to Houston, gets a video tribute, he's signing sneakers and tossing it to young fans. I mean, it's all about James Harden right now. And everybody that had an issue with where he was in his career and trading away the future is probably thinking otherwise right now because of how well he has played. I mean, the questions are still going to remain when Kevin Durant comes back, what the team looks like. You'd expect it to be even better than it is now. And some of James Harden's postseason shortcomings, uh, that's another thing that needs to be answered. Uh, but when you got the two guys that you got that are teammates with you, you would think that that's going to help that story a little yeah, bit. Yeah, there's no, there's no question for James Harden. It's going to come down to the playoffs um, just simply because that's the knock against him. It's really the only knock against him. Sure. But now that he has the help of Kyrie Irving and when Kevin Durant comes back, there there should be you know, all the opportunities for him in the world to continue to do what he's doing. The one thing I will say about him, and I, 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 you, I really watched him more in the playoffs than any – because because of where they played there in the Western oh, you're Conference, you're not watching regular you're, season no, Rockets no, basketball. I mean, and come on! You wake up. What you do is you wake up, you watch the highlights, and you see his numbers, and you go, right. "Wow, he had another great game." Mm-hmm. But when you watch a game like last night, the thing that really strikes me about him is about how easy it looks watching him. I I don't even see him sweating, and he just kind of like dribbles the ball, and when he doesn't have the ball, he just kind of stands around, and then the ball comes in his hands, and then he. Takes a fadeaway jumper and and it's swish. It's like it's there's like no, it's just the way he plays. I'm not saying that he's not giving effort. Of course he's giving effort, but I don't necessarily know that I've ever seen a player be able to do what he does and make it look so easy. Yeah, I mean that's that's a good point. I'm trying to think of somebody that would be a comparison like that and right off the top of my head I mean you know Kyrie when he gets going he makes it look very easy too I, you have to admit he definitely does but th- there are times where you could watch James Harden and I try to do this the last couple of games watching him where well, he just stands around when he doesn't have the ball and he's conserving energy I guess you could call it that he doesn't need load management because he gets it during the game <laughs> and then when he gets the ball in his hand he just sits there a couple times through the legs he may make a step forward, a jab step forward, and then he steps back, and then he hits a three, and then just kind of meanders back on defense. I, it's it, the at ease at which he plays is what's more amazing to me than anything. I, I didn't realize how easy he makes it look. Yeah, and there was an announcement yesterday, I guess, that they're going to retire his number in Houston. It wasn't a surprise that they were going to do that at some point, but to announce it sort of yesterday on his way back so soon after the way he forced himself out of there, I guess, didn't sit well with some Rocket fans, but, you know, this is one of those things that, you know, eventually the wounds get healed. Eventually they do. Now, I know he didn't deliver a championship to the Houston Rockets, and that's always going to be something that's there, but they're going to look back on his tenure with Houston and say, this guy was one of the great players that we've ever seen here, and they'll hang his jersey in the rafters, and that'll be that. I mean, we've seen some really messy divorces with all-time franchise players in all sorts of sports, This was a really bad one, but time heals the wounds, and then you remember how good that guy was for you. A guy you talked to with uh, game time, with Brett Favre. That was one of those messy divorces that happened. And then he was so spiteful that he went to one of the Packers' biggest rivals. You know, the interesting thing about that story is that when he left Green Bay, and it it was a thought that he was retiring. Sure. And he flew home to Kill, Mississippi with his agent and his wife. <clears throat> when he landed, he had decided, you know, I want to get to the Bucks. I want to go play for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and John Gruden. I know the offense. I know the coach. That's where I want to go. Plus, I'll have a chance to beat the Packers in the playoffs. Or I don't know sure. if they had a game that year against each other or not. But he really wanted that. And then when he landed, uh, his agent called him and said, uh, I got some interesting news for you. The Green Bay Packers have just traded your rights to the New York Jets of all places. 
like like the Packers got in front of him going oh, yeah. to Tampa. Right. I, I didn't realize that. I, you know, I, well, it's been a long time since that happened. I didn't I didn't realize that it went down like that. Yeah. Well, he desperately wanted to get to a place where he could shove it in the Packers' face. Right, and he he also said, you know, I, I love Mike Tannenbaum. He tried to do everything right for me and all that other stuff. He said he was on the sideline of a game in Seattle as the Jet quarterback, and he said to Eric Mangini and I guess Brian Schottenheimer, he said, look, guys, I don't think I can play. You know, I have this uh, this problem in my right bicep. I guess he pulled a tendon in his right bicep or tore a tendon. And he goes, I can't control where the ball's going. <laughs> He goes, and they said, you know, you just got to, if you can gut it out, gut it out. These are his words to me. And he goes, I, I'm trying to throw to a ball that, that I would normally throw. And he goes, sometimes my arm hurts, sometimes it didn't. But what I had was just the lack of belief that I could get the ball where it needed to yeah. go. So how about a little, because this is reminding me, how about a little Boomer and Carton, Boomer and Geo history okay. for you right here. So the first game that Brett Favre played against the Packers, you guys took me to that game. So it was out in Minneapolis. It was at the Metrodome. And it was the first time you took me, it was just me and you to Lambeau Field. And that was Aaron Rodgers' first start. And it was against Tavares Jackson on Monday Night Football. The first time that Favre played against the Packers was at the Metrodome. He went to Lambeau later in that season. But it was at the Metrodome in Minnesota. And you guys, we all went. Al went. Craig went. Obviously, you went because you were calling the game. And we were all there together. I don't know if you guys, you guys did a million of these trips. I only did a couple of them, so I remember every single one. But I remember sitting at a bar. You were working, obviously, right. with Al and Craig. And we were having drinks in the hotel bar in Minneapolis. And then we went to the game. And then I ended up standing behind in the press box, Mark Murphy, who is one of the big execs there. Well, he was the president of the Packers, yeah. And Ted Thompson was then GM. I think yeah. might have passed away. Yeah, he did. He has passed away. Yeah. So, Ted Tom, I was sitting behind them, and I remember as Brett Favre's throwing touchdowns in the Metrodome as a member of the Vikings <laughs> against the Packers, <laughs> and the place is going crazy, and just looking at their reaction, stone face, but I could see, like, the veins in the side of their head popping out, <laughs> like, oh, God. This is, like, the last thing that they wanted to see yeah. when he left. Right. And that's why they tried to send him to the Jets. They wanted him I know. out well, of the did, conference. Well, and they did, but yes. then that you know, only a year didn't work out. He got himself to Minnesota, and that was that. But uh, that was uh, that was an amazing time, and I got to see it firsthand and up close. I, I thanks totally to you guys. forgot that you were on that trip. Yeah, I was on that trip. Do you remember that, Al? I do because I got to meet uh, Tony Dorsett was on the sideline because it was some sort of anniversary or they were they were doing uh, because Tony Dorsett had that 99 yard run in the Metrodome on a Monday night. Right. He was there on the sideline. So I do remember I have a picture with Tony Dorsett. Man, you guys got you guys got to do a lot of fun <laughs> things with me. Oh, yeah, I know. Oh, my God. I forgot how much fun we used to have, Al. I know. Was like, when you were doing that Monday night football, I mean, that was like, you know. <laughs> lifetime stuff when you had you were asked to like bring me i went to three games with you i went to the two viking packer games right uh one at lambeau one at the metrodome and then i went to vikings bears you took me to at soldier field that that was was that a cold night or was that no it was like october it wasn't that cold i remember a night uh where i took gunner to a game in chicago because he was a green bay packer fan it was the packers and it was so cold. I mean, it literally was like minus five degrees wind chill at Soldier Field. And pregame warm up, you know, right before that, we walk out on the field. I'm, Gunner wants to see Soldier Field, and it's pretty cool how it looks inside, outside. It's ugly as hell. Inside, it looks pretty cool. So we're walking on the field, and there's one guy out there on the field with us, just one guy. There's no security anywhere around. That's how cold it is, and that's how early before the game it is. Yeah. And there's Aaron Rodgers sitting on the, uh, the bench of the Packers, mm. just sitting out there by himself. So we went over and had a nice conversation with him. That's great. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it was a pretty cool uh, memory for Gunner. But, yeah, I, I miss those Monday night games. I miss calling the games. But what was really a lot of fun for me was taking you guys to those games. Yeah, so the distinct memories that I have, the first one with Lambeau Field was obviously the Marv Albert story that I've told a million yes. times in the limo. Boomer lashing out. <laughs> uh, the one in the Metrodome when I went with you guys was standing behind Ted Thompson. Where, where, where was Jaworski? Jaworski was on the field where he called Matt Leinard and Vince Young the C-word. Oh, that's yeah. right. but that, yeah, so those that, two guys but, but are the that C night, word. That, but it was that night. That was the Lambo night. Yeah. Oh, that was, was the Lambo night. That was right. the Lambo night. Okay. It was yeah. It was me, you, and Ron Jaworski standing <laughs> on the field. He's like, he's like, you want to know who's a C word? Matt Leinart. 
And then you were like, what about Vince Young? Him too. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that happened. Yes. And my, my uh, this is a little more inside, but people understand if I have a friend like this. My lasting memory from the Soldier Field game had nothing to do with a celebrity, but rather your best friend, businessman, Lee Becker, when we were up in the radio booth, Lee and I, because we were like together that day. Yes, you know, yes, Lee I remember was, that, yes. Lee was like my chaperone. And there was a cooler filled with sandwiches. <laughs> And he pointed to the cooler filled with sandwiches, and he goes, can you grab me a sandwich? So I grabbed him a sandwich. I handed it to him. It was in foil. And I'd never seen this before in my life, but I respected it so much. He didn't open. He didn't ask what was in there. He didn't open up the sandwich to see what it was before he decided if he was going to eat the sandwich or not. He just opened up the wrapper and took a bite. <laughs> and then as his mouth was filled with the sandwich, he looks at me and goes, roast beef. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, Lee was uh, a big man who liked to eat. <laughs> yeah, but I respected the hell out of it because yeah. so am I. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the red bell so you're notified when we have new content.